Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another week of our Accelerated ID series. Today, we're going to be talking about instructor-led training. My name is Shantae Skildager, and I am a former fifth grade social studies and science teacher. I made that transition into instructional design without going back to college and getting another degree, without spending thousands of dollars to, to make that transition. And you can do the same, by the way. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars or go back to college and get another degree. Since I made that transition, I have worked in higher ed, I've worked as a freelancer, I've worked as in corporate as an instructional designer, and I've worked in non not-for-profit. And I've really, I think I've worn just about all the hats on an L&D team. I have been the Jill of all trades where I did all the things, instructional designer, the training facilitator, the e-learning developer, the compliance officer, the LMS administrator, the L&D team marketer. So we're going to be talking about what is instructor-led training, how it differs from the other formats. We're going to talk about some design considerations, and then we're going to talk about some of your deliverables that you will create as an instructor or sorry, as an instructional designer for our instructor-led training. That really feels like it could be a tongue twister. Say that fast three times and see what happens. Okay, so what is ILT? Sometimes you'll see it as ILT. Sometimes you'll see it written out as instructor-led training. Sometimes you will see it or hear it called synchronous learning. So instructor-led training is what you're experiencing right now, right? There is an instructor, this is live, it could be in the classroom, it could be virtual. Of course, if it's virtual, we call it built or virtual instructor-led. And the, all that is, is synchronous learning. So as you become more experienced or as you are learning more about instructional design, you're gonna see terms like synchronous or asynchronous. And so when we're talking about synchronous, all that we're really saying is that the instructor and the participants are in the same place. Or maybe I shouldn't say place, maybe I should say in the same space, right? Whether it's a virtual space or it's an on-site space. So there is a person that is live and there are participants that are live. So that's what we're talking about whenever we when, when we refer to ILT or instructor-led or synchronous. So the differences between instructor-led training and virtual instructor-led training in e-learning. So let's talk about that. So again, instructor-led training, it's synchronous, it's in person, you're in the same place. It can be one-on-one, -on -one, it could be a group, it could be something large like a workshop, it could be a large presentation from the stage, right? So there are lots of different formats that you can see the instructor-led in-person happening. Then with our virtual instructor-led, which is really what's happening right now, you might be used to using Zoom or maybe Teams or WebEx or Skype or even Google Meet for some of these virtual instructor-led trainings. For our masterclass that we have going on right now about how to become an instructional, instructional designer in 2023, we're using a tool called Big Marker. But all of these tools enable us to have still a synchronous learning experience, but we're doing it in a virtual space. And then of course we've got e-learning. So e-learning is asynchronous. Your learners and your instructor are not in the same space at the same time. They are not both live together in a learning experience, right? So our e-learning could be things like you go into a learning management system, you click on project management, you take that course, it's self-paced. You could do one lesson today, another lesson tomorrow, or you can binge consume all of those lessons, which we are a binge society, right? How many of you like binge through Netflix episodes like I do? <laughs> so e-learning is usually delivered through some type of platform, what we call a learning management system. So in corporate, you see learning management systems like PeopleSoft or Cornerstone or Workday or... Um, I can't think of any others right now, but there are so many of them out there. Then in higher ed, you see learning management systems like Canvas, Blackboard, eCollege. And then if you are working with people who are learningpreneurs who have their own course, then you're seeing learning management systems like 
Teachable, Thinkific, Kajabi, Searchy, right? So there are all kinds of platforms out there that enable e-learning to happen. And we build those e-learnings, these asynchronous learning experiences in rapid authoring tools like Storyline 360, Rise, Captivate, Lectora, or we create instructional videos that people can watch asynchronously like YouTube, right? So those are just some of the very basic differences between instructor-led, virtual instructor-led, and e-learning. So these are all things that you're probably familiar with because you have experienced them. You just may not have known that they had lingo attached to them. Our benefits of instructor-led training are things like in an, in an instructor-led uh, training experience, it can be personal. So whenever you're in this instructor-led training experience or this learning experience, you can make personalized connections. I can call on people. You can ask me questions, right? So there's a connection between the two of us or all of us because you can also respond to one another as well. And then in our hands-on experiences or the, another benefit is hands-on experiences where I can give you a problem to solve, or um, you could work together as a group to figure something out. You can network with one another. And by the way, these are things that can also happen in virtual instructor-led. And then there is just a, a higher perceived value when you can bring people together to interact, especially post-COVID, right? There, there's a premium on bringing people together. Um, and actually, there is even increased fees right now. So we're seeing that with some of our clients who do in-person facilitation. So they had one rate prior to COVID, then everything shifted online. And now that people are going back into in-person, there's like a premium fee that's attached to it because it takes a lot to go in-person and deliver instructor-led training. Now, some of the challenges can be that instructor-led training is expensive. There's often travel expenses, there might be room expenses, there might be technology expenses. Um, yeah, so there's quite a few different things that are associated with that. Facilitator expenses, if you're hiring an external facilitator, that facilitator may have to travel. They get per diems for their day. So it, overall, it can just be very expensive. There's, for those who have to travel somewhere to participate in that training, they have to do time away from work or um, time away from home, away from the family, hotel stays. It's not self-paced. So if they're going through, let's say they're going through um, a certification type thing. Katie's going through disc certification right now. So let's say you were going through disc certification and you had to travel to go to that disc certification. So one week you might be doing a, a session somewhere and then you have to wait till the next week to do a session somewhere. And then maybe you've got to wait another week to do a session somewhere, right? So because it's not self-paced, it can be really drawn out and take some time to complete. And then of course, instructor-led can be difficult to scale. So what we mean by that is, let's assume for example, that you are working for an organization. It's a global organization. There are 20,000 people that work in this global organization. And there is some training that the leadership team wants rolled out across the entire organization globally. All 20,000 employees have to take this training. Now, can you imagine if you had to deliver all of that as instructor led? You would need a team of facilitators to roll out that instructor-led training to 20,000 people. There would be lots of travel. Either the facilitators are traveling somewhere or the employees are traveling somewhere. Talk about cost, man. The dollars are really racking up in this scenario, aren't they? So it can be really hard to scale. Whereas if I had built this learning experience as an e-learning, for example, or maybe a series of e-learning sessions, I put that into our learning management system. I could have that rolled out across the entire company within a month, right? If we just have a due date by which everybody has to be trained. So in my instructor-led training model, it may take me a year to get 20,000 people trained on this particular topic. But if I put it into e-learning, I can roll that out and scale that a whole lot faster. All right, so I'd love to just pause for a second and hear from you. 
So at some point, you're probably going to say, Shantae, you kind of sound like a broken record because you keep saying these things over and over. Well, the reason for that is because these things are kind of use universally true, but there might be nuances based on the medium. So when we're talking about our instructor led training design considerations, you've got to know your audience, right? Well, this is true for every learning experience you create, but think about, just imagine that if you created a fun, lighthearted training, maybe it's on emotional intelligence and you're bringing in some fun examples, and you're delivering to a room of engineers, right? Your engineer sometimes, and I'm not knocking engineers. So if I have any engineers right now, this is this is not a, a take or anything like that. But they often are very process oriented, and you know they're they're logical. And I know that I'm putting people into a bucket right now, but just kind of go with me. You're bringing in fun, and they're like serious, like teach me the facts. I need to know how to do this thing. I need to be good at this. So you've really got to know your audience and tailor that learning experience to who is in the room. If, for example, I hopped on here one day and we start talking about API and like the back end and how you do the integrations and all these different things, you might be like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm here to learn about instructional design. And while APIs have a role in instructional design, that's kind of an advanced level topic. So we might not be ready for that. So you do need to know who your audience is. One of the worst things that can happen in an instructor led training is whenever you are sitting in the room and you have all the people in front of you and their eyes are just like glazed over like, whoa, where are we right now? Or Maybe you only see the tops of their heads because they are not paying attention in any way. So you've got to know who your audience is. You also want to make sure that you are chunking that content into relevant and logical sections. As you are becoming more versed in instructional design, you're going to hear this concept of chunking. You're going to hear it a lot. So chunking just simply means that we are creating bite-sized chunks of content. We deliver some instruction and then we create some sort of pause in that learning experience so that people can interact with that content. And whenever I talk about a pause, it might be like do a turn and talk or it might be that I pose a question. I ask you to, to put an answer in the chat or if you're in an instructor led training, it could be that there's a dialogue that's coming back and forth or you're brainstorming solutions. So instead of, to, instead of just continuing to push that content out, we stop the push and then we start interacting with the content and then there is a push of content again. And then that's where that engage the learners with an activity every seven to 10 minutes. Now, whenever we talk about activities, we're not, this doesn't mean that things have to be fun. It just means that we need to give that brain break so that people can interact with that content and each other, right? Some of that networking happens, some of the relationship building happens. We take that the concepts and we we're moving them into our long term memory by um, manipulating them in some way. So it's just really important that we try to build in these brain breaks and have opportunities for our brains to make sense of all the information that we just learned. And then, of course, with our instructor led uh, training design considerations, your visuals are important. Your visuals su should support the content that is being delivered. They, there, it shouldn't be something that's on the screen. You're like, what? So if I'm talking about instructor-led design considerations and I put a picture of a leather sofa on the couch, that is either like going to hook you in some way or it's going to be a distraction if I don't have some sort of connection to that couch. So the images have to support what it is that we are saying. So like every the whole picture overall supports the information that I'm sharing with you. And then each of the individual um, sections with pictures that are here on the screen support that bucket or that domain that I'm talking about. So images are important. All right. So instructor led deliverables. So as we're getting close to the end here, let's talk about the things that you might be responsible for creating as an instructional designer. You're responsible for creating visuals. So you would create the visuals for the slide presentation, something like this. You would be responsible for creating a participant guide if that was a request. You know, 
participant guides are not requested for every single in-person learning experience that we create. They could be considered a best practice because they can help with the retention of the concepts that are being delivered. They can help with engagement by giving your participants a tool for people to interact with. So they're important, but sometimes the reality is that we're moving really fast in our instructional design projects and that we don't have budget and we don't have time to stop and create participant guides. So while they may be a best practice, they're not always required or even asked for. And then facilitator guides, these are the guides that help instruct facilitators. They could be something like real high level notes. They could be bullet points. They could be full out scripts with like, here's your objectives. Here's the key points to, to hit. Explain, here's the things that you say. Here's the activity. Here are the tools that you need. Here's how long you'll have. So the quality of a facilitator guide really varies depending on what the project is, what the budget is, and how much time you have. But these are some of the most common deliverables that we are asked for whenever we are building for instructor-led learning experiences. So as the instructional designer, you often create these things, and then there is some sort of handoff to someone else. So maybe if I was the instructional designer on this and I created this, I might hand it off to Katie, who is then the facilitator right? So for those of you who are looking to make the transition in 2023, especially if you are a teacher who does not who does not want to return back to the classroom in the fall, then I highly recommend that you check out the masterclass and see if this is a good fit for you. And then the other thing that I want to share is that we have just relaunched our instructional design and tech accelerator system. So this is our revamped version of our Instructional Design and Tech Accelerator program, our certificate program. This is, it's updated for 2023. It's expanded, it's improved, it's enhanced. It's got a lot of really great things that are going on with it. 